Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Environmental Social Justice. I am your host, Wendy Nystrom, with my co-host, Joel Vendette. Today, we have Mr. Stephen Rothstein. He is with Ceres. He is the Managing Director for the Ceres Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. So welcome to the show, Stephen. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you, Wendy. I'm thrilled, and thank you to both of you. And real quick, could you tell people what Ceres is and why it was founded and the circumstances of which it was founded? Sure. Ceres is a nonprofit, been around for over 30 years. And after the Exxon Oil Valdez spill, investors got together and said, we really need to understand more about policies of companies. In that case, if Exxon had had a double hull tanker rather than a single hull tanker, not just would have saved the environment and the birds and the and the biodiversity, but their stock price would have been better and their fines. So from a, if all you care about is their, is their financial, it would have been better. So the investors said, we need to understand more about this. That's led to today, we have an investor network that is $60 trillion of assets under management, 220 investors from very big ones to small ones. And they're all saying they want their portfolio to be responsible both to the financial and fiduciary needs but also to the long-term needs of society. And they understand that climate and other issues are affecting uh, the, our society. You know, I was actually in Alaska right after Exxon Valdez happened. So I actually got to see some of that damage. And guys, it was pretty, pretty devastating to see the oil just seeping on rocks and getting into crevices. But what a great thing to come out of it, to teach people how to do things better. And to, as Steve and I recently discussed, doing the right thing. And the topic we're going to really focus on is insurance and with respect to ESG. And what people don't know is ESG is environmental social governance, which has been taking a beating lately. So, Stephen, could you explain why ESG is actually still important, why it matters? Well, if somebody, forget the acronym for a second. If somebody said, um, think about the last few years, we had a nature-based crisis called the pandemic that has affected everything we do, from where people work to the supply chains, to who's sitting at the dining room table. Pandemic is an ESG issue. It affects environment, society. And so the, the basic idea is that we live in a society that, that shareholders aren't the only ones that are important, but it's stakeholders. Employees are important. Regulators are important. Customers are important. So if you think about that, all, and, and they will affect your stock price. They will affect where you do business. Um, I'll give you another example. A year ago, I'll bet not a single company who there are 700 companies that have pulled out of Russia. Um, they pulled out because of Ukraine. Um, they didn't pull out because their business, they weren't making money there. They pulled out because of societal, moral, political, customer yep. pressure. That's an ESG issue. Um, so it's thinking about the broader issues, whether it be the pandemic, whether it be uh, what's happening in Russia or climate. On climate, we've seen the numbers are growing, growing in terms of the risks that last year we had $145 billion of economic loss. They're projected 2022 to be worse. We had Hurricane Ian, we had floods and fires and droughts. And so these are affecting companies. And as we've all seen, if it doesn't affect the individual company, it'll affect their supply chain. I'm glad you mentioned supply chain because um, one of the things that we talked about that's very important that people understand, not only about ESG, and let's, let's forget the acronym because people are misusing it and it's being weaponized almost. But when you talk about procurement and supply chain, a lot of people may not understand one, what procurement means. So if you could very simply define that and two, why is that so important and the lessons we've learned specifically in these past two years? Yeah. So it's, it's buying stuff. Every company that, that we buy things from, they buy parts, components, or, or they'll buy coffee for the office, they'll buy office furniture. So the things that they buy, I'll give you a, an example of the federal government. So the largest procurer in the world is the federal government. They, they spent last year about $630 billion on buying things from paper clips to helicopters and everything in between. They've just announced a draft rule that says, if you're a medium or large size supplier, not the smaller ones, that you have to share certain climate information. Um, and that is a great thing. And so we've, we're now finalizing draft comments. Um, people could reach out to Ceres and, and we have information on our website and people could submit comments on their own that once the final rule goes in place, the, the United States government will be the largest purchaser in the world and the only government that is asking environmental questions as part of their purchasing scheme. 
and it'll change the industry. In the 1980s, I'm dating myself, but I worked on an initiative to try to get the federal government to start to require recycled paper. Well, fast forward, everyone uses recycled paper today. The federal government can have an enormous impact on that. So procurement, whether it be on what you buy for your home, for the company you work for, or the government, the city or state that you live in, or the federal government, has an enormous impact on the carbon in our, uh, in our society. So I just have a quick question for you. So you said that they're going to start requesting <clears throat> the information about the environmental, you know, what these companies that they're purchasing from do. Uh, is there going to be any repercussions if they're not happy with what they're seeing? Or is it just going to be like, yeah, we want to know, but we're still good? Uh, there are going to be repercussions. So first is they have a draft rule. We don't have the final. But they're basically saying is if you're a medium size, then you have to submit information about what, uh, what's called scope one, scope two, basically what you're using. And if you don't submit it, you're not going to be allowed to bid. Uh, now, they, they have certain waivers. They have ways to fix it. They give, you know, so there, there, are, there are, are due process. But over time, this will be a requirement of bidding. Again, just for the largest, to give you context, the federal government buys things from around 500,000 companies. This will affect the top 1.3%. So only a few thousand, but those companies reflect 85% of the carbon emission from the federal government. And then they'll be able to possibly lose these contracts if the if things are okay. Right. Just want to make sure that there's just you want to make sure that there's something in there to protect it as opposed to saying, thanks for telling us. Yeah. Okay, you know. And, and that's what happened in the past. It, it, it hasn't happened. And it will also reduce the risk. Why is the federal government? Because if you if you're the federal government, you buy from a company and they don't have plans for floods or fires, then th their supply chain are impacted. And you may not get your goods and services. We've seen from diapers to microchips to all kinds of things in society. So they're doing it not just because it's good for the environment. They're doing it because it makes good fiscal sense. Good. That's good news. That I, I didn't, one of the things um, circling back to supply chain, we learned a very hard lesson by having everything overseas. Because when the pandemic hit, we're still suffering from not having enough chips being processed for vehicles and cars and, and computers. We're bringing that back home is my understanding, which is fabulous, but um, it's slow process. And how, how, what can we look forward into the future that you're seeing? Cause you're kind of in the forefront. You're, you're one of the leaders in all of this. Um, we are bringing it home and I give the Congress and the Biden administration credit. They passed bills like the infrastructure bill, like the chips bill and others that will provide seed money for this, particularly some of the high tech to come back to, to what's called reshoring rather than offshoring. Um, and I think that's important. It's important from, a, from an economic perspective, from a national security perspective, from a supply chain. And, uh, you know, experts say it's not a question of whether we'll ever face another pandemic. It's when uh, or whether we'll face another climate emergency. It's when. So having that redundancy having that supply chain, having it closer, not for everything, but to have enough that if there's a problem, you have another alternative. So we think that's a great alternative. And again, it's part of the range of ideas. And we also hope that if you're thinking about all these things, you're thinking about carbon impact. Um, yeah. So that, you know, whether you're buying, if you're an manuf uh, airplane manufacturer, I just read an article today that a big company is buying 20 new planes and those planes will use 25% less carbon output for every seat uh, because of the way the planes are designed. So we have to find ways to reduce our carbon output while we're continuing our economic growth in society. There is actually a ton of new technology being developed. Um, I've met so many entrepreneurs and startups that are working on new tech, but just real quick, um, insurance. This <laughs> insurance and doing the right thing. So my background being insurance, people always ask me, why don't we just cover climate change? Well, you have to have something tangible to cover. You have to have a risk. Could you kind of dive into what that means for people? What the insurance, you know, insurance is with respect to climate and any risk management that they could have? Sure. So there, the, I, I can only talk about insurance for the next four hours. So I hope you... You uh, have the time. It's, it's, oh, a big, you have <laughs> it, it, it's a big, complicated issue. So there's two elements of insurance. First, the products they offer, and then their investments. And the products they offer, I'll just give you coal. So uh, as an example, half of the insurance companies have stopped insuring new coal deals because they don't believe they're good, not just for the environment, but financially. Um, so part of the question for insurance companies is what are they insuring 
for new transactions? And are they thinking about the risk to health and safety as well as the finances? If you're, if, and then the second is, are they insuring new technologies? So whether it be a new EV charger or solar on roofs or wind, and their insurance are doing more, but there's a lot more we need to do. One of the areas that insurance industry overall it hasn't done as much as they need to do is, is for low income people, that there are people that because of fires or floods or tornadoes, and I can give you lots of examples where they, they, you know, half the people in our country, if they have a $400 emergency, they don't have a backup. So if somebody has a flood, they lose their washer dryer in their basement, they're, they're, or they, they can't pay their mortgage, and then they, or they lose their car, then they can't get to work, and there's kind of a ripple. So there's a lot of creative people doing work in the insurance industry. There's a lot of insurance companies. There are regulators. We're doing a bunch of things that are working there. But, but we all, so the insurance industry and society, we need to do a lot more faster to make this transition. Oh, absolutely. Uh, go ahead, Joel. Sorry. So, okay. So I actually have a question for you on how insurance, how, how, how insurance works. So say, you know, we just had another fun leak with the, everybody's favorite Keystone pipeline. That was pretty bad. How does insurance play into that for the people who have to live with the repercussions of it getting into the water system? And basically they're just using paper towels, from what I'm gathering, paper towels and socks and the same technology that's been there for 20, 30, 40 years to clean it up. So how does insurance play a role into the people whose lives are going to be devastated as a result of that? Well, again, this is a, the, the author H.L. Mencken said, for every complex problem, there's a simple answer that's always wrong. So I apologize. I'm going to, this is a, this is a, there are many elements, but so just to take, if there's a pipeline leak. So the first question is, does the pipeline have insurance? They probably do. Yep. How much insurance? And then who are the beneficiaries? And will, you know, are they, are they going to pay that to the shareholders or to the local parties? Right. And what, what's the community agreement? And one of the areas that we as society have not done well is particularly for local communities in underserved communities, whether you think about Flint, with the water system or recently Jackson water or indigenous populations um, where they have been the short end of the stick over and over again. So will a pipeline get cleaned up? It's first, what's the insurance company going to do? What's their agreement with the local community? Who's monitoring it um, from a fiduciary area? But, but overall, I don't want to say all insurance companies, but overall, not enough been done. And the Flint, Michigan story, and, and unfortunately, it's been played out over and over and over again, Jackson yeah. and many other places are, I don't say it's perfect examples, but are awful examples of where we as a society have let our fellow Americans down. But don't you have regulations in place that when you have a spill that you are required by law to clean it up to background conditions? Um, yes, there are regulations in place, but uh, like, like they often say, the devil's in the detail. Who defines background? Who's monitoring it? Um, you know, in Jackson, they were saying, well, gee, the, the city was now responsible because people weren't paying their bills. People weren't paying their bills because they were getting dirty water. So they didn't want to pay for polluted water. But then the states, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a very complicated issue. So please don't think I'm summarizing Jackson to be in, in, in 30 seconds here. But so they said, oh, no, the city now, they voided their agreement because they're not paying their bills. So yes, in theory, you're talking about it. But it also means strong advocacy. We also have in our country, you know, there's still a lot of racism and racial discrimination. And so that yeah. people uh, who their voice, they're not always literally at the table. That is very true. I mean, the people who are the gr greatest, affected the greatest by these tragedies are never the ones that are invited to talk at the table. And that absolutely needs to change. And we, we talk social justice quite a bit in this group. Um, I made Joel laugh. So did you want to add something, Joel? I know all I can think is, and we're very fortunate that we have no corruption in our government policies. We're very fortunate, you know. That's all. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, one of the things in the, in the, the Biden administration has done is they've, they've done an EJ40 to, to say 40% of money spent on these initi climate issues should go to serve uh, low-income families. And that's a great effort, it, translating that into policies and actions. But uh, there is great movement there. But we need it at the city level. We need it at the state level. We need more at the federal and clearly in the international. The same thing on the international side, that, that India is growing their economy. But as part of it right now, they have a all fuels are welcome. So that means yeah. and half of their, their roughly half, not exactly, of their energy is from coal. So that's going to serve a lot of people there. And as I say, it's a very inter, 
uh, connected society. Uh, you know, we, we saw from Pakistan where a third of the people lost their homes because of flooding. Yeah, that was devastating. You know, I'm glad you brought up the energy issue because um, one of the biggest discussions at COP27 in Egypt was underdeveloped countries or developing countries were being told, don't use coal, don't use petroleum, it's bad. And their response is, but you guys caused these problems. You know, the developed countries, the Western countries, this is your fault, not ours. And you're telling us not to do these things, but we don't have any other alternatives. And I think the messaging after COP was, we Western companies or countries need to help the developing countries with their technology and pay for it because we kind of caused it. This is, this is kind of on us. We absolutely do. I mean, just to take, um, you know, uh, Pakistan, where, again, over 30 million people lost their homes because of flooding, Pakistan causes somewhere around 1% of the emissions in the world, um, yeah. but they're dramatically affected. So, yes, we, and, and there are, and, and to do that, we need government to be leaders, we need private sector, entrepreneurs, and there are a lot of creative people uh, doing new technologies. Um, and the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, is going to invest 369 billion or some number close to that in various startup technologies. So there's a lot of reason for, I, I'm an incurable optimist, um, so hope, but the, you know, uh, as they say, you know, a dream without money just becomes a nightmare. So we, we need to have those resources. But we also yeah. gotta make sure that in order for these things to actually happen, that we can eliminate some of the red tape and bureaucracy, because I think that's really what creates one, the expense of a lot of these things and the time it takes to get things underway. I mean, it's just mind blowing to me how much red tape and hoops people have to jump through just to get a simple question answered. I mean, whether you're talking about, you know, environmental issues or housing or helping the homeless or prescription drugs, anything, it's, it's mind boggling to me, you know, and it always comes down to money. I've always, we've always said this on the show, oh, just yeah. follow the money and you'll know why things take forever or don't work. But I mean, I'm incredibly optimistic as well for the, infla in the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes, I'm not going to say the acronym because that's a whole other issue. Um, but it, yeah, I think how do we how do we work on that though about getting rid of this red tape and the bureaucracy that log jams everything? I believe the White House already established an or um, a department headed by Christine Harada, which is supposed to be helping people cut through that red tape. Stephen, you may know more about that. Department. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the answer is we have to view us all as owners, not renters. Meaning, it's, we, we all have to work on it. So, at a local level, we have to be help to advocate. We have to help our fellow citizens again, who maybe not have a seat at the table. Um, we have to elect. Um, people at a local, state, and national level who see this as a problem and want to get right to the point. There are a lot of people in government who are doing this, but some who aren't. Um, and we have to you know, work with companies so that they're helping to create, uh, uh, reduce the log jams as well. So it is individuals, corporations, the, the media getting the word out. Um, so it's all of us. Another issue. It's also changing our, our perspective. And many economists will probably want to slap me for saying this, but we need to stop putting profit at such a high pedestal and start thinking about the people and the damage we're causing for the sake of profit. And um, Joel's smirking because we talk about this a lot. Money will always win. And we need to change that, that messaging. And my dog just rolled onto his back. So I was smirking at that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were laughing at me. <laughs> Um, but, but in, in, I mean, you, I, I think you make a really good point, Wendy, as, as always, but, but if you look at a, as a long-term investor, if someone's going to put their money away and say, I want to take it out in 30 years or 20 years or 40 years, in fact, those aren't in contradiction. Exxon Valdez is again, a great example. If you're thinking about the long-term, then there is often alignment that, and there are lots of studies, literally hundreds and hundreds of studies that show Companies that think about the long term, sure, in the short term, they might not have done as well in that quarter. And if all you're going to measure is a quarterly profit, that may be different. But over the long term, they will do uh, well, in some cases, even much better. I would personally love to see a lot more investment in some of these new startup technologies, um, people who are trying to build things that have no CO2 or net CO2, rather than maybe some cryptocurrency issues that have recently developed. I personally would love to see more people invest in the solid technology of, of tomorrow's investments, but um, that just might be me. 
Well, I think there are more opportunities. So, for example, recently, the federal government allowed a change in the rule for, for retirement funds so that now for uh, uh, anyone can go to their employer and say, I would like to have a climate oriented fund as m among the options. Um, um, and employers didn't do that before. 95% of employees last year did not have the option for this. Today, under these new rules for the Department of Labor, they will. And that will affect 60 million people. That's, a, that's about $7 trillion invested in retirement funds. So if 5% of people or 10% of people said, I want to put my money in a climate-oriented fund, we're talking tens or maybe hundreds of billions of dollars. So there's, there's enormous opportunity for those technologies, Wendy, that you want to uh, encourage. I absolutely love it. And we always promote the new technologies and the entrepreneurs and the startups because sometimes you need those guys thinking outside of the box to come up with these game changers. And that's what we're going to see in the future. Um, Joel, did you have any other questions you wanted to ask or are you good? No, I think, you know, I think that's fascinating what they're talking about as far as the investment policy goes. But I think, you know, I want to circle back to something you said, which is, you know, the media plays a role into this as well. And how do we get that's another issue in and of itself, but how do we get one cohesive message out so everybody knows about it and knows that this could be a good thing? So how do, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, th this is one of those, if you have an hour, we can have a detailed conversation <laughs> about this, but it's really hard because it used to be where, you know, this was said, you know, I wasn't the first one to say this, used to be that everyone had common facts because they all watched the same shows or read the same newspapers and they had different opinions. Today, people have different facts. Um, cause they, uh, and so it's hard and we are more polarized and we've seen it on climate. We've seen it on democracy. We've seen it on other, other issues than, than I wish we were. So the answer, there's no one answer, but having said that again, I am an incurable optimist. The, the recent election, irrespective of whatever party, and I'm not partisan is that, that, that democracy won, that people who said democracy wasn't important, they lost. And I think that is an American value, irrespective of party. Um, so that is a sign of hope that the messages are getting through. And, just, and optimism is great. And honestly, a little self-promotion here. This is why I started environmental social justice is a lot of us environmentalists, we talk in our own language and it was exclusionary. And I said, when I grabbed Joel and I grabbed Joy and I said, I want to do this where we talk to the general public. We let them know what's going on out there, what's happening, what's developing new technologies, what sustainability means, what climate change means in a simple, unbiased fashion. So we're trying, we're out there trying. <laughs> Making a big difference, both of you. I hope so. <laughs> on that, so Stephen, how can people get involved in, in Sirius? What can they do to, to join you guys or volunteer? Because I know you're a 501c3, donate. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. So our website, CERES.org, series.org. And there's inform you can sign up for newsletters. Obviously, we'd, if you want to donate, we'd love that. There's lots of resources, reports, um, ways to sample letters to send, um, press releases. So there's lots of resources. Um, my in email is also there. Uh, love to talk to anyone who wants to get involved or if you have questions um, about what you can do, the impact of regulatory issues, insurance, banking, uh, biodiversity. There are so many areas that uh, would love to talk to you. So again, it's series, C E R E S dot org. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question. I want to oh. end this on an optimistic note of all the uh, items that are in the, in, the in, uh, inflation reduction act. What are you most excited for? Uh, I'm going to answer with two that uh, there are the, the range. In other words, that covers, from renovating of homes to solar on roofs, so that serving Native American areas, so the range of things. And then particularly they're starting, I think it's a 27 or $28 billion climate bank to help promote these new technologies um, and to innovation. So I, I give the writers of that bill, the legislators, the president, everyone else, lots of credit. I love it. That was brilliant. And what a positive note to end on. So thank you, Stephen, so much. Thank you, guys. I'm Wendy Nystrom with Environmental Social Justice with my co-host, Joel Vendette. And thank you, Stephen, from Sirius. Guys, check them out. Donate. Help them out. They're doing wonderful stuff. You guys take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.